there's no doubting what you've achieved on a technical level. This is clearly pushing the engine. There are just certain design choices that were made for this game that we don't fully understand. We were hoping that you could shed some light on those. You can walk, you can crawl. It's equipped with some of the best environments this series has ever seen. It has a variety of gameplay styles. It even has an entire voice cast. With all due respect, those aren't the design choices we were curious about, Mr. Coffin. I do not like Sister Location, but for the longest time, I thought I did. For years, I would look back at all the games and think of Sister Location as a standout title in a sea of repetitive back-to-back -back entries. I'm sure many, many people feel the exact same way about it that I used to, but after replaying it recently, I would be lying if I said I enjoyed my time with it at all. It's rare you play a game that you thought so highly of for so long, only to have that false reality shattered within only an hour of playing it. Sister Location is like one of those kiddie roller coasters. When you're younger, they feel like the most crazy and insane thing ever. But the more time passes, the more you realize you're a 45 year old man and a small rocket ship roller coaster isn't actually very interesting at all. And is in fact quite bland and boring. Maybe you still try to fit into that now tiny, tiny seat out of pure curiosity, but the ride soon to follow is guaranteed to be one that will never live up to the expectations you set in your head when you were younger. Except, a kitty roller coaster has significantly more value than sister location, because you can burn it down to scraps and metal to build something worth way more money. If you buy sister location, the best you can do to improve it is to install one of the many, many mods the community has made. Oh, <laughs> never mind. Very quickly, Sister Location went from one of my favorites of the original Scott games to my absolute least favorite. But why? How could such a seemingly fresh and innovative entry in a series known for getting stale at points be so bad? Well, to get into all of that, we first have to look back at every FNAF game before it to understand how we got here. Trust me, it's worth getting this out of the way now and it won't take very long. I guarantee you I can do the shaky vent part of Sister Location, just stay in place and not get jump scared by the time this section is over. In fact, I'm so confident in this that I'm going to save you the effort of booting up the game and keep a vent cam in the corner of the screen so we can make sure I'm telling the truth. FNAF 1 is seen by the general public as a spooky jump scare survival game. And yeah it is, but if you've played it before, you would know that there's way more to it than that. It acts more like a strategy game where you need to keep track of a bunch of things at once to make sure you can survive the full night. To me, this is the core of Five Nights at Freddy's at least the original run of the series. Every night, new threats are added or made more aggressive to test the skills of the player and make sure they're always staying on the absolute tips of their toes. Boiling down FNAF to its basic gameplay elements is essentially one gameplay loop that is constantly being made more difficult as you continue to play each night. That is Five Nights at Freddy's from a literal gameplay standpoint. This formula is then followed loosely for the next three titles in the series. FNAF 2 has a different gameplay loop from 1, but the structure of the game and how it increases in difficulty remains the same. Each night, more stuff is added or made harder until you beat the game. FNAF 3, while only having one animatronic technically, introduces the Phantom slowly throughout the nights to make you play the game more carefully and strategically. Springtrap, of course, gets harder to deal with each night of the game as well. FNAF 4, once again, follows the basic boiled down formula for a FNAF game. Sure, it's a little different from the three prior games in its presentation and style of gameplay loop, but at the end of the day, it's still a series of nights that follow the exact same gameplay loop that adds or adjusts threats as the game progresses. You may be thinking after all this, of course Scott would want to try something different after four games in a row following the same core gameplay philosophies. And you're not wrong, he decided to make a game called FNAF World. This game, while maybe not being super relevant to the conversation at hand just yet, is still an important turning point in the series to bring up. Since this game is an RPG and not a typical FNAF game, there was bound to be a whole lot more writing and a direct story compared to the previous entries. Which is true. However, it's the way the game was written that's really important here. A majority of the writing in FNAF World is very self-aware and full of jokes. This, of course, works fine for an RPG spin-off that isn't trying to take itself very seriously. But just keep that in the back of your head as we continue forward in this video. One pixelated death in a Halloween update later, and we finally reach sister location on our timeline. Now, this game is very different from the other mainline FNAF games that came before it. 
opting to be a point-and-click style game with mini-games spliced here and there. Sister Location completely throws away the core FNAF gameplay loop that we were just talking about, which in theory could work if the game was still fun. So, does Sister Location do a good job moving the FNAF series forward by removing the gameplay that made it so interesting in the first place? <laughs> Dude, just read the title, we're gonna be here for a long time. Hey, I think it's about time we check back with our shaky vent. Surely something has come to jump scare us after all this time waiting and doing absolutely nothing when there is a very clear and active threat being presented in this situation. Surely this entire section isn't designed to just catch the player off guard only the first time they play the game. <laughs> oh wait it is, <laughs> damn, okay, wow. Oh shit. What's gonna happen? Oh no! I, sure hope I, I hear noises! Random event. Ah! I'm gonna die! Yeah. <laughs> what? No, I'm gonna- I'm- I'm not do- I'm- I am actively not playing the game and there is noises happening that is- that are bad. I'm- I'm gonna die. Kill me! Oh, so cool if that actually Kill him. Hello? Oh, I think it gave up. Sister location, sister location, sister location. Where do I even begin with you? I have never had more to say about a game in my life. Surprisingly, I do have some positive things to say about it, which may come as a surprise to you after that entire intro section. But don't get it twisted. For every positive thing I have to say about this game, there's about 10 negative things bouncing around in a harmless shaky vent, just waiting to be blurted out. And yes, that whole shaky vent section was a bit of a joke, but it does help illustrate one of my biggest issues with this game. This is by far the least replayable game in the entire series. Every FNAF game before this encouraged a ton of replayability whether it be through the inclusion of a custom night to mess around with the game's core mechanics on a harder difficulties, or extra challenge modes such as those found in the FNAF 4 Halloween update. Even FNAF World has a million different endings and secrets to find that would maybe encourage the player to go through it a couple times to find everything there is to offer. Also, with the extremely large number of animatronics you can use in your party in that game, just the ability to use a different team each time encourages replayability. Sister Location, aside from its own custom night mode, which we will get to much later, lacks any replayability in a series pretty much famous for it. Not only can you not replay any of its minigames on their own for some reason, but the game is absolutely littered with scripted events that become more and more obnoxious the more you play the game. The Shake event, for example, would have been a really easy section to turn into actual gameplay rather than a scripted event. You're trapped in this tiny vent, trying to get out, and all of a sudden, you're a bunch of loud noises and the vent begins to shake. In the actual game, this is just a cheap scare that adds nothing to the overall game really. But if the gameplay was put first here, there could have been something really similar to the Tiny Vent Music Men from Security Breach. Sister Location insists on treating itself like some kind of free roam game. You have to use WASD for pretty much every single movement action, including pressing W to go forward in the vent. It's fine to set up a game like this, but at least utilize the fake free roam in interesting ways. For example, Instead of this stupid vent section being just for spooks and not actually dangerous in any way, give the player the ability to turn around in the vent to look behind them. Turn this boring, pointless vent section into a minigame where you need to turn around every time the shaking happens to scare away the bitty babs, making the ruckus at the end of the vent. It doesn't even need to be a very long gameplay section, but it at the very least adds more gameplay to the game overall it makes it less of a snooze fest on repeat playthroughs. Instead of, oh boy, time to go through this stupid vent again and hear the scary noises, it turns into, oh boy, time to play this part of the game again in this video game that I enjoy and respect. Yes, I am that petty. I will talk about a 10 second section of this game that nobody has ever thought of in probably literal years. Anyway, the game is literally full of shit like this. I'll go into more detail on each one as we get to them, but I just wanted to give you a little taste of what's to come. First though, we need to talk about something that doesn't even have to do with the game itself really. We gotta talk about the box art. Well, okay, it's hard to call it box art when it's really just the cover for the digital game, but you know what I mean. Let's take a look at the box arts for every FNAF game up until this point. Uh, except for FNAF World, because literally, who cares? FNAF 1, Freddy Fazbear is front and center. Makes sense, it's the first game, and he's literally the namesake of the series. FNAF 2, Withered Freddy. Once again, makes sense, and looks a lot better than if Toy Freddy was on the cover. Sorry, Smike. FNAF 3, Springtrap. This makes sense. While not the namesake of the series, he's the only real animatronic in said game, and is the main antagonist of it. It would be pretty weird if this game, all about Springtrap and his story and lore, had a picture of Phantom Freddy on the cover, right? That would take away from the importance of Springtrap in this game. Okay, so clearly Scott is not above using different characters for the box arts if said character is extremely prominent in the game. Good to know. 
FNAF 4 and Nightmare Freddy. You could argue that Nightmare Fredbear would be more fitting here, but he's supposed to be a surprise in the game since his design was never fully revealed before the launch of FNAF 4. Using Nightmare Freddy here makes a lot of sense. Okay, so now we're at Sister Location. You'd think that Circus Baby would be front and center here, right? They guide you through the entire game. Their design isn't a secret as it was shown extensively in teasers and the trailer alongside the literal intro and literal title screen of the game. Okay, so let's see it. What's the box art for a Sister Location? Fun Time Freddy. Fun Time Freddy! A character who is, yes, in the game, and yes, has a lot of screen time, but isn't that important overall to Sister Location, and is clearly taking the spotlight away from a much more obvious candidate. Wow, what a stupid point. Why would you even bring this up? Oh uh, yeah. Or even trying here? Blah, blah, blah. One! Clearly, Click Team and Scott thought this was important as well, because guess who's on the box art of the console ports of Sister Location? That's right, motherfucking Circus Baby. And two, I'm using this kind of funny note about the game to segue into a much bigger point. That being that Circus Baby is heavily underutilized in their own star game. This is THE Circus Baby game, so tell me why the only render of her in any of the actual gameplay is her lifelessly sitting on a fucking conveyor belt in one of the worst sections of the entire game, which trust me, we will get to later. For a game that focuses so much on Circus Baby and has so much of her talking and building a bond with the player, there sure is a major lack of her physically being there, ever. Even if all her renders were kept in heavy shadows, it would at least be better than literally almost never seeing her at all. You never see her behind the glass here, she never jump scares the player once in the entire game, despite essentially being the main antagonist, and no, Enner does not count, I'm talking about Vanilla Circus Baby. And she isn't even included in the obviously not canon custom night mode for literally no reason whatsoever. What is the point of ignoring her so much? If Scott wanted to create this character that never shows up and just guides the player around, that's fine. But there are so many sections in this game that would be visually enhanced by a sliver of Circus Baby physically being there. For example, when the lights go out in this one section and she starts talking to you, would it not have been sick as hell if her face lit up behind the glass in the darkness FNAF 1 Freddy style? Or once again, bringing it back to this awful conveyor belt section, why the hell doesn't she jump scare the player here for messing up the code instead of maskless Enner doing it? Having her spring to life and jump scare the player from a lifeless position would have been an insanely cool visual. And don't use the, oh, she's still trying to trick the player at this point of the game, she wouldn't hurt you, oh, Circus Baby would never hurt you, excuse. Assuming that the player character dies here regardless, I would rather it be by Baby turning on you than maskless Ennard popping up when they show up yet again in the section directly following this one. I will not take story reasons as an excuse for lackluster gameplay or missed potential, since the story literally could have just been tweaked to include these extremely weird omissions. Here, I'll tweak the story right now to make this baby section better. Have it so messing up the passcode canonically puts baby into some kind of attack mode, and she jump scares the player out of her own control. Boom. I just made this section slightly cooler, and the story is literally the exact same, just with one new detail added that never has to be brought up ever again. What really stings, though, is that Circus Baby did eventually get a jump scare in a Scott FNAF game when UCN came out. But if you know anything about that game, you'd probably know that pretty much every single jump scare sucks complete ass. And Baby's is no exception. The jump scares in Base Sister Location are genuinely some of the best in the entire series. The idea of the animatronics having faceplates that open up to reveal creepy looking endoskeletons is incredibly creative, and easily one of the best things about the entire game. In fact, I'm gonna rank every jump scare in the game right now. Biddy Bab. Not as interesting as some of the other jump scares in this game, but I like the tiny face plates. Six out of 10. Ballora. Her endoskeleton looked fucking terrifying, and the fact it happens from pure darkness gives it bonus points. Eight out of 10. Fun Time Freddy. Pretty good, but not as good as Ballora. Seven out of 10. Fun Time Foxy. I shit bricks every time I see this. 10 out of 10. This, this thing just <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Is that real? Yeah, I didn't fucking expect that! Bon Bon. On its own, it's okay. But the PNG texture of a flashlight blocking out most of it brings it down a few pegs. 5 out of 10. Mini Rena. Ew, but 7 out of 10. Maskless Ennard. It's okay, but the lack of any super fast moving parts like the fun times hurts this one. 7 out of 10. Ennard. You could have told me this was a UCN jump scare and I would have believed you. 
2 out of 10. In fact, I'm not done talking about this jump scare because it is genuinely one of the most odd decisions from a visual perspective in this entire game. From multiple renders, we know that Ennard's mask can open up similar to the Funtime animatronics. This opening of the faceplates is what makes these jump scares so effective in my opinion, and the custom -like jump scares that lack them are significantly worse because of it. So why was Ennard, given the ability to open at least a part of their mask, just to never use it in any of the jump scare animations, when it would have made them significantly better? This is probably the jump scare you will see the most in the entire game as well, so having it be the literal weakest one is a major oversight. At least Scott added multiple variations of the Ennard jump scare depending on the circumstances you die in, but they're all pretty much equally shit. Anyway, back to Circus Baby's UCN jump scare. This being her only 2D jump scare in the entire series is such a shame, and it really just makes her not having one in the game sting even more. Yeah, I know she has one in FNAF VR as well, but it looks pretty garbage. Her faceplates barely move. TLDR, Baby got screwed over in her own game, and that sucks. Am I done with the introduction segment yet? C can I talk about the entire game from start to finish now? No. Story? What do you mean I have to complain about the story? When have I ever talked about story in depth in a FNAF game before? If only I knew someone who actually cared about the FNAF story in the slightest, who could complain about the story for me while I sit back and eat Sister Location brand popcorn. Okay, buddy, whoa, okay, yeah, you can do it, you can do it, dude. Despite being the game with quite possibly the heaviest focus on storytelling in the entire series, Sister Location always felt like it didn't fit in narratively. It introduced concepts and environments that were so over the top that it completely spoiled my immersion with the world that Scott built in the previous four titles. You see, despite introducing many unrealistic ideas, the FNAF series was one which felt grounded enough in reality to be immersive. FNAF 1, for example, while featuring a premise which could never happen in real life, presented a real enough setting and story that one could suspend their disbelief while playing it. The same applies to the other three games which came after. FNAF 2, while being much bigger and more chaotic, kept to the dingy pizzeria style of the original game that we expected. FNAF 3, while introducing an extremely over-the-top concept like Springlock suits, did so in a way that felt grounded in what the technology of the series was capable of. 4, of course, was a big departure, but it felt grounded due to the nature of the game game being set in a dream and being in a very personal environment like a house. When we look at Sister Location though, this game completely jumped the shark with what the technology in the FNAF universe was capable of. The environments and animatronics in this game are far more advanced than anything we'd seen before, and while they both end up looking really cool, they completely break the ability to suspend your disbelief. The other big problem this poses comes into play when we're supposed to pin this game's story somewhere in the pre-established timeline. There have been arguments for years about when Sister Location is supposed to take place, and the big problem with these arguments is that no answer makes sense with what we know from previous titles. If Sister Location were to take place before FNAF 2 or even 4, then that would mean not only was William Afton building murder robots before the missing children's incident, but that extremely advanced robots like Circus Baby existed alongside the original FNAF 1 crew of animatronics. If we were to try to pin this game as happening in the future, there would only be a couple of places it could possibly fit in. It would have to take place after the closure of Freddy Fazbear's Pizza, but it would also have to take place before the events of FNAF 3 since William Afton was the one who built these robots. That would most likely leave Sister Location as happening sometime in either the late 90s or early 2000s, which still doesn't add up with what we know was possible at that time in universe. Now, trying to peg this game somewhere in the timeline aside, let's take a look at what this game individually brought to the series. In my opinion, the ideas and lore that Sister Location brought to the table permanently changed the FNAF universe in a negative way. The heavy sci-fi approach led to many concepts which would become staples in later entries, as well as being retconned to exist in previous ones, causing the series to spiral in a much more ridiculous direction. The prime example of these concepts I'm talking about being 
remnant. Giving an explanation to the paranormal in a way that boils down to a science, to me, completely kills the eeriness and mystery behind the possessions, which made the series interesting in the first place. What went from a simple story of ghosts and hauntings turned into a sci-fi narrative about giant scoopers making these things possessed, and a mad scientist trying to harness it for immortality. And the way we see this concept explored led to one of the most ridiculous moments in the entire series, where we see a rotten corpse possess its own dead body because of Remnant. I know that there are a lot of Michael Afton fans, but this is a piece of lore I could just never understand. By making this happen, it kind of just kills the point of possession to me entirely. Now, moving on from Remnant, there is one more thing I'd like to discuss that Sister Location added and changed, that being its portrayal of William Afton. Now, this may be a bit of a hot take, but I feel this game was the beginning of William Afton's downfall as a character. To me, what made him work in the previous four titles was how grounded he was in reality and mystery. All we knew about him was that he was a child murderer in some small town who eventually died himself. This was a much more simple version of the character, but one that worked because he felt like he could exist in real life. However, when Sister Location released, we saw this character shift from his original idea into that of a mad scientist, building robots that defy any form of reality and using them to research Remnant to become immortal. It was such a massive departure from the original character we knew, and I felt like it was such a massive jump that it completely killed any creepiness he once had. I'm not against giving the character a name or personality, but completely changing what he does in the story like this makes him feel like a completely different character altogether, and this massive change would spark his continuous downfall in the series to me, with him being depicted like this in Pizzeria Simulator, and then becoming even more cartoonish with his portrayal in Help Wanted, and then Security Breach. Giving an explanation to a mystery or character isn't the problem here, it's the way Scott went about it and what he chose to explain. Lane. William Afton is a character that was explored in a way that never felt intended with how he was originally written, and Remnant is a concept that nobody asked to be explained at all. Both of these poor explanations were given to us in a game which departs so far from the series that it just doesn't fit no matter where you try to pin it in the timeline as a whole, making this game almost feel like it's not supposed to be there. I feel like Sister Location would have benefited the most from just being its own unique story that has nothing to do with FNAF, because as it is, it feels very alien from the rest of the series. Those are just my thoughts though. If you disagree, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this game and the way it's presented. I always love to see different perspectives on the storylines like this one, especially in a community with such differing opinions like the FNAF franchise. Anyway though, I think it's time I stop my rambling and give the spotlight back to Aya. Uh, yeah. Goodbye for now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, there. Now you can't complain about me not talking about the story. Well, actually, you can technically still do that, since I didn't actually talk about it myself, but you'd probably look stupid doing that. Also, also, by the way, please go check out Pastor's upcoming analog horror series. The link will be in the description. Okay, thanks, bye bye Now that I've covered a couple of my miscellaneous points about Sister Location, and I've laid the groundwork for a couple of my bigger points later in the video, it's time to go through this entire game from start to finish. I'm gonna talk about every single night, every single minigame, every single ending, and every single little thing that makes me think this is the worst of the Scott Cawthon FNAF games. I hope you're ready, because we're really only scratching the surface right now. By the end of this, you'll probably either want to punch me straight in the face, or you'll come to the dark side and fully understand why this game has not held up very well over the years. At the end of the day, I don't really care as long as you hear me out and give me a chance to explain this whole mess. Let's get into it. Sister Location is probably the best YouTuber game out of the entire series. I say probably because it's hard to beat FNAF 1 in that regard, but just looking at it from a basic level, it has a lot more moving parts to keep the viewer engaged. The gameplay changes each and every night, so the viewer doesn't have to keep watching the same loop over and over again. It is very, very story heavy, so you can watch it almost like a movie. And watching a YouTuber play it, you get to see their reactions to all the scripted events for the first time. I fully understand that a large portion of the fan base has never actually played any of the FNAF games, and even a smaller portion has probably ever even played Sister Location. So, just as a guess, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the people who love this game 
have never actually played it, and have just watched someone else play it. From that perspective, I can totally see why someone would love this game, or even have it as their favorite. Hell, if you're really only into FNAF for the story, this is the most story-heavy game of the original Scott Cawthon series, so it also has that going for it. But coming from the perspective of someone who has very little nostalgia for this game, has played it multiple times over, and has spent literal hours and hours thinking about it and talking to people about it for this video, I have to say, the more you think about it all, the more cracks begin to appear in the foundation of this game. The more stupid design choices start to rear their ugly head the more insane parts of this game begin to look even more insane than they did before. Trust me, this video is not being made on a whim or with very little thought put into it. I have thought about Sister Location non-stop pretty much all month in preparation for this video. So, try and put any thoughts about Sister Location you already have set in stone aside, especially if you haven't played it before, and allow me to explain everything. This isn't coming from a place of pure hatred. I'm going to be as fair as possible to this game, even if I dislike it a lot. I've already given props to the jump scares, and that isn't where my praise for Sister Location ends. Keep that in mind as we go forward here. But without further delay, let's dive straight into Night 1. The game starts off inside an elevator that's slowly going down to a facility that keeps animatronics stored away until they are rented out for parties or shows. This concept is actually really cool, and is a nice change of pace compared to the other games in the series. The environment in Sister Location look amazing. That's something I have to give the game right off the bat, because almost every single area looks at least good. While the more high-tech sci-fi aesthetic may be a downside to some, it's generally one of the only positives to me. Almost every room render looks great, with a few exceptions, and oftentimes the worst of the visuals simply comes down to the engine the game was made in, that being Click Team. If you've looked at FNAF gameplay for long enough, you'll probably notice a lot of the games have this cylinder-like effect that warps the backgrounds to feel more 3D. Sometimes this works great, but other times, not so much. The elevator is actually quite a good example of it being put to good use, since the render is made with the cylinder warping in mind. I'll bring up more of the environments as we get to them. Here we're introduced to Hand Unit, who is essentially the phone guy of this game. This is probably a hot take, but I really, really dislike Hand Unit. The writing for the character often leans too much into humor, which is fine in concept, but in execution it takes a lot away from the overall experience. Humor is a subjective aspect of any piece of media, so it's hard to definitively say that the game isn't funny. But at least to me, I didn't laugh out loud once, and I often felt taken out of the experience when Hand Unit made the same shitty LOL I messed up your keypad input joke each night. Using the keypad below. Oh, give me the cash basket! It seems you had some trouble. The cash basket. I see what you were trying to type, and I will auto correct it for you. Thank you for selecting exotic button. Let's go! You're probably wondering why I'm even bringing this up. Well, looking back at the previous FNAF games, a lot of them also had subtle jokes and humor, but they almost never took away from the experience and instead added to them in ways that felt very grounded. For example, Phone Guy in the first two games has a lot of lines that are funny, but in an awkward, kind of realistic way. Phone Dude in FNAF 3 is also hilarious to me for a couple reasons. One, having a surfer dude bro be the phone guy, even if it's only for a little bit, is just a funny concept on its own. But it also feels extremely realistic for this late teens, early 20s dude bro to be working at this crazy horror attraction. It's funny, it works, it never overstays its welcome, and it adds to the world in a way that doesn't feel out of place. The humor in the first three FNAF games was extremely subtle, realistic for the scenario at hand, and fit into the games perfectly. Hell, even small things like being able to honk Freddy's nose in the offices and don't poop on the floor being on the list of rules in FNAF 1 are kind of funny jokes that are more hidden away and add to that awkward, quirky sense of humor the first couple games have. I never felt taken out of the game world, and it all felt very natural. You want that when you're trying to build a horror atmosphere. Let me remind you that this is a horror game. Having this joke-cracking, robotic-ass voice talking to the whole game feels so out of place, and I am extremely glad that Baby begins to have a more prominent speaking role as the game goes on. So, what do I think happened here? Why does this game have a much more lighthearted and jokey script for the Phone Guy equivalent compared to what came before? Here's my theory. Scott had just finished writing for FNAF World, which we established earlier has a much more meta and funny script. This works because the game is supposed to be lighthearted. It's not building up a horror environment, it's building up a funny little RPG world. I think Scott saw the somewhat positive reception to the writing of FNAF World, and whether it be by accident or deliberate, decided to make the script for Hand Unit much more fun and humorous. 
The literal definitive proof for this is that when you get all three stars in the game and go back to the extras menu, there's a PNG of the exotic butters you get after completing your week at work. When you click on it, a soundbite of hand unit saying, exotic butters, plays. Here now. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I know you did. Exotic butters. Where's his eyebrow? Exotic butters. Exotic but- uh, Exotic- yeah. You may be thinking, oh, of course Scott would do that. Exotic butters is a meme. Well, here's the thing. This wasn't added in an update or added in a patch after the fact. This has been here since the launch version of the game. Scott thought people would find this joke so funny that he had to put a button for it in the extras menu. Which, hey, there's nothing wrong with that, but it proves that he thought the script for hand unit was funny. Once again, a completely subjective aspect of the game, but I had to talk about it. Outside of hand unit, however, the writing and voice cast for Sister Location is actually quite good, and is one of the best aspects about it. So don't think I'm trashing all of the writing here. All I'm saying is, I think hand unit and his shenanigans are not very funny, and kinda feel out of place in this game about getting jump scared by killer robots, and getting scooped alive and used as a skin suit. Oops, uh, spoilers, uh, by the way, spoilers for, uh, spoilers for Sister Location in this video. Nothing really happens on the first night of Sister Location, which is fair for a couple reasons. First of all, this is a completely new style of gameplay compared to the other games in the series, so making the first night have no real stakes allows the player to get used to everything. Another thing, FNAF 3 also did the same thing, where the first night has no real threat and is just for world building. So hey, whatever, that's fine. As long as the following four nights are jam-packed with content to make up for it, there's no issue here. This night consists of clicking on light and electric shock buttons to make the animatronics revert to a working state, and crawling through a couple vents. That's about it. The night ends with the dreaded shaky vent that I talked about earlier, which would have served as a place to put a small, easy minigame to get the player used to that part of the gameplay, but whatever. I already talked about that for long enough. Every night in this game, I'm going to tally how much gameplay is accomplished. The gameplay in Sister Location is split up into four varieties. First, we have the button clicking gameplay. This is the mind-numbing, boring stuff you have to do almost every night of the game. Clicking on the buttons for the animatronics, going through vents, yada yada. The next gameplay style is the story-focused minigames. These are minigames that barely count as games and are more just for story reasons. They barely have any actual gameplay to them and are the worst offenders on repeat playthroughs. Next up, we have the semi-story-focused minigames. These include minigames that are typically about going from point A to point B while not getting caught. They're there to flow the story together, but they also feature actual gameplay. Finally, we have the actual minigames. These are actual minigames with full mechanics that could be separated from the story and still work on their own. These are typically the most fun parts of the entire game. Okay, great. With that out of the way, let's tally up night one. We had a bunch of button clicking, and that's it. This style essentially doesn't count as gameplay. So let's just say that night one of Sister Location has no gameplay. This is A-OK, -okay. like I said. Maybe a semi-story focused minigame in the shake event would have been cool, but it's the first night, so I can't really get too heated over it. Almost every night in Sister Location ends with the player, who is Michael Lafton by the way, I should probably rip that bandit off, going home to watch a TV show about Vlad and Clara. A couple consisting of a vampire and a human arguing over if their baby actually belongs to Vlad. You may think because of my humor rant earlier, I would be all angry about this, but actually I think this is perfectly fine. Funny even. These moments in the game are the downtime between the horror sections. The tension being built up there is completely irrelevant here, and I think these are actually really great additions to the game. You can even munch away on some popcorn while watching which is a fantastic addition. I'm not gonna bring these up again, just thought I should mention my opinion on them here. Night two opens up with Hand Unit becoming a more interesting character. You might see it walking around. I'm gonna play these vintage audio training tapes. Oh, get me out of this fucking place. There's so many but- You know the routine. Shut the fuck this ever. Guy's better than Andy Field, though. This guy is better than Andy Field, unless this is Andy Field doing a voice. It's not. No, it's a different guy. A dead body was found in this vent I once. Found in this vent. Okay, so not that funny, but it's a story. It's a story. Jokes aside, I actually do think an angsty teen, maybe dialed back a bit, would have been a better companion for this game. Story-wise, I guess it wouldn't make that much sense. But like I established earlier, you can always tweak a story to make things work, so that's not much of an excuse. That aside, this is the first real night in the game to include actual gameplay. Not only that, this is the only night in the entire game to feature all four of the gameplay styles Sister Location has to offer on a single run. Not only that, but this is the best night in the entire game. 
After this, it's all downhill. The first gameplay segment of the night is about you protecting yourself from the bitty babs under a desk, using a piece of metal to protect yourself. Here's an example of the cylinder warping looking really ugly. In fact, a lot of things here make no sense. Why are the holes in this piece of metal so perfectly smooth? Scott loves to model things with this Minecraft pixel art looking ass withering all the time. So the one time that would have actually worked, he opts to make this worn down piece of metal look more like a gray block of cheese. This is a story based minigame and actually isn't much of a game at all. Baby tells you to hide under here to protect yourself after hand unit shuts down, but all you actually have to do is click down and move your mouse to stop the bitty babs from moving the metal away from you. It's a pretty nothing section, and it's over before it even feels like it starts. For the first actual gameplay section of Sister Location, not a great first impression. Oh, this is so bad. Oh, 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 oh. oh my god, that was a close one. It's not like the fucking door goes the exact same length every single time you play this game and it never changes. Okay, bye. Hand unit comes back online and tells us to rush through Ballora Gallery to make it to the breaker room. However, before he comes back, Baby tells the player not to listen to him and to instead take your sweet ass time getting through the gallery. This is the start of Baby manipulating the player into a false sense of security. She helps out Michael Afton to try to win him over slowly and surely throughout the game. Next up is the Ballora Gallery minigame, which is the first minigame in Sister Location that has some actual gameplay behind it. The controls from the vent section are carried over here as you need to crawl from one side of a room to the other. The room is pitch black, except for a door that has lights above it at the end of the room. If you hear Ballora's music get too loud, stop in place and wait for it to die down. While no music is playing, you can sprint for the door. Extremely simple game that is an all right challenge. Here's my biggest issue with it, however. It's super simple when it really shouldn't be. What I'm talking about is this scripted section of the minigame where Ballora spins across the screen to the other side. When this happens, you have to stop and wait for her to leave. This is a cool section until you realize the way it's scripted makes it happen at the exact same point every single time you play it. This is just insanely missed potential. Ballora spinning across the screen should not be a scripted element, it should be an actual mechanic in the minigame. That's what FNAF's gameplay is all about to me, throwing a bunch of threats at the player and having them deal with it. Have it so you have to listen to her music to make sure it's not too loud, but also have to watch out in case Ballora spins in front of you. That adds both an audio and visual aspect to the minigame, and that simple change alone adds so much more to it. Too many things in this game are scripted segments when they should have 100% been actual gameplay mechanics. Not only would this have made repeat playthroughs way more interesting, it would just make each section of the game that much more fun to go through. It just hurts me every single time I play the Ballora minigame and get to the part where she spins and every single time you have to sit there and wait for her to leave at the exact same spot when that idea would have been perfect as an addition to the actual minigame mechanics. This isn't like a thing where when you're done, you're done either. Even if you complete this minigame and get to the next one, if you die there, you're sent all the way back to Ballora Gallery. So this isn't even a thing where it just makes repeat playthroughs less interesting, it also makes repeat attempts on a single playthrough less interesting. I would have much preferred more fleshed out minigames with proper checkpoints after each one rather than what we got, being a bunch of half-baked minigames that you need to complete in a row without dying, or else you're sent all the way back to the last insanely brutal checkpoint. This is where scripted events like this in a game where you're probably going to be retrying things a lot becomes a very apparent issue. Things like this during minigames makes them lose their punch, fast, when actual additional mechanics would work significantly better for repeat tries and just overall in general. After crawling through the gallery, you're greeted with one of the best minigames in Sister Location, that being the Funtime Freddy Breaker Room minigame. You're given a monitor that you flip up FNAF camera style, that features a bunch of systems that need to be restarted. Each system has a load time to restart them, that starts at 0% until it's completed at 100%. You have to hold down each system to make them reach 100%. However, Funtime Freddy is active in the same room as you. He'll make attempts to get close to you while you're restarting each of the systems. So every once in a while, you need to put down the monitor and play an audio cue to trick him into going back to the starting point. Restart each and every system to finish the minigame. In concept, I like this minigame a lot. It has a very classic FNAF feel to it, since you have to balance an office section and a camera section to survive the night. However, as cool as it is, 
I think it might be too simple. The audio cues can kind of just be spammed whenever you can use them. So there really isn't any skill on that front. It kind of just boils down to increase system to 50%, close monitor, spam audio until it's safe, go back to the monitor, rinse, repeat. I think a pretty simple change here would be to have two different sets of audio cues depending on what side of the screen Funtime Freddy is on. This idea is heavily inspired by his appearance in this game's customite mode, where depending on the side he's on, you need to close different doors to stop him. So in my hypothetical improvement, if Funtime Freddy was on the left side, you'd play audio using the A key, and if he was on the right side, you'd play audio using the D key. That way you have to put a little more thought into what you're doing in the office sections of this minigame. Either way, this is still one of my favorite minigames here, but I think some things could be tweaked a bit to make it a little better. I should also say that visually, this part of the game looks fantastic. All the different Funtime Freddy renders look great, and the area itself has a lot of detail. Once again, in my ideal sister location world, each minigame is more interesting and fleshed out, but has a checkpoint at the end of them to make up for the more complex mechanics. The way the game is currently set up, sure, having to redo multiple minigames if you die does add a lot of stress and tension to the game, however, it's in a very artificial way that makes it kind of feel unfair. This isn't Oh, I'm so scared. I gotta get through this scary section again. I'm so tense. This is, oh, I'm so annoyed. I gotta watch Ballora spin around in front of me for the 14th time. Not to say I died 14 times here, by the way. I only died once because I'm a gamer. Anyway, after you finish up in the breaker room, you can run through Ballora Gallery again without having anything to worry about. And that is where the night ends. Yep, that was the best night in the entire game. A night where I complained about every single minigame, at least to some extent, and went on a long ass rant about scripted events in short minigames. This is going to be a long video. However, I will give props to this night for having a lot of gameplay, even if one of the three sections barely counts, and for having a decent variety as well. On the gameplay tally here, we have our standard button clicking gameplay that almost every night features, a story focused minigame in the form of the Biddy Bab survival section, a semi story focused minigame with the Ballora Gallery, and an actual minigame with the Breaker Room. So far, so good when it comes to content. Hey, if each night keeps this pace up, Sister Location might not actually be that bad. Sure, maybe the quality of each minigame won't be amazing, but at least the content's gonna be there, right? Right? Night 3, baby! It starts off the same way the previous nights do, with you clicking on a bunch of buttons, seeing weird stuff happen, until you're given a task for the night by hand unit. Night 3 has you going through Funtime Auditorium to get to Parts and Service, to do a routine checkup on Funtime Freddy. Having Funtime Freddy be the end goal of the night again is a little weird, but it's not really that big of a deal. Just kinda odd. This night does something a little different, however. When you're finally able to progress to Funtime Auditorium, you're given a split pathway. You can either listen to Hand Unit and do the task at hand, or disobey him and go forward to Circus Gallery. On paper, this is a great idea. This entire location is set up in a way where you'd think you'd be given a lot more options on where to go, and this appears to finally be utilizing that. However, all going this way does is give you an exclusive bit of Circus Baby dialogue that's important for something else later in the game. Nothing changes if you go to this room, and after you finish up here, you just continue the night like nothing happened. The real kicker? Not counting entirely different endings, this is the only optional path in the entire game. You're never allowed to explore the location for secrets or take alternate paths that lead to different endings. The entire game is pretty much on rails. It's really disappointing too, because having the game set up in a more task-based way could really fix a lot of its issues. Imagine that instead of a set path for each night, you have a time limit of let's say 15 minutes and a series of tasks to do during the night. You can do these tasks in any order, as long as you finish them all within said time limit. That way, you can explore the entire map in any way you please, and everyone's playthroughs could be a little different. I think that would really sell the whole being a handyman thing a lot better than how the game currently presents it. Anyway, all I'm really saying here is that I wish there was more exploration in this game, and I wish there was more alternate pathways that actually led to more interesting things. After you finish hearing what Circus Baby has to say, you're able to go through the Funtime Auditorium. This minigame is pretty similar to the Ballora Gallery one, but instead of being based on audio, it's based on knowing your surroundings. Your goal here is to get from one end of the room to the other, just like Ballora Gallery, except this time you're provided with a flash beacon that creates a small flash of light in the room for you to check your surroundings. Occasionally when you flash your beacon, Funtime Foxy will be standing there. When this happens, you just have to wait in place and flash the light again to make sure they're gone. I know people often have trouble with this one, it's not explained super well in game, but the best way to do it is to listen to the quiet noise that plays after you flash the beacon. 
A good rule of thumb here is to crawl while the noise is still playing and stop when the noise stops. At that point, flash the light again to check, rinse and repeat until you make it to parts and service. This minigame is... fine? I don't actually know if I like this game more or less than Ballora Gallery. It can get pretty tense at times, I will give it that. You're probably thinking to yourself, okay, so the first minigame is pretty simple. Surely the next minigame in this night will step things up a bit. This is the only minigame on night three. I am completely serious. The parts and service section is literally just clicking a bunch of buttons on Freddy where messing up will result in a jump scare. The actual quote unquote mini game part of this is when Bon Bon jumps off Freddy's arm and you have to click on the button on its body to finish the section. The quote unquote mini game here goes either one of two ways. Either you completely struggle to figure out how to bait Bon Bon to come out or you know the surefire strategy to hit his button every single time in that case, this entire section is literally just clicking buttons. You're not gonna you're not gonna go anywhere, right? You with your like warping ear? You're not gonna like leave me, right? You better freaking not. Great work. Oh! Do you know the strategy? You will now be that every time? To remove no, how do you do it again? Power module from the okay, Bonnie we'll hand puppet. Go, look at his center. Press the okay. large black button go to the left Bonnie's corner. bow tie to release the power module. Like just all the way to the screen. Okay. Then go right. All the way to the right. Just like just straight up? Fast, all the way to the right. Okay. Yeah, all the way to the right. Now slowly drift to his left shoulder. Or, sorry, his right shoulder. Go to, not the side you're on. Go to the other side. But slowly. I think he'll be there. Yep. That's Great so job. fucking dumb! Every Does that really work every time? Tasks yes. for the night. What? That's so dumb. In the other case, you have to replay the Funtime Foxy section over and over and over again just to get another shot at trying to click the button again. And that's it. That's night three. Genuinely, probably the worst night in the entire game when it comes to content. You exit parts and service, get jumped by Foxy, and are transitioned right into night four. So, remember when I said night one having no content could easily be made up for if the other nights were stacked with content? That's pretty much completely out the window now. For the sake of putting this all on the table right now, let me break down the rest of the gameplay this game has. Night 4 is one 3 minute minigame that is insanely difficult if you don't know what you're doing. And even if you do know what you're doing, it still serves as an insane difficulty spike in this game with pretty easy challenges thus far. Night 5 pretty much has no gameplay whatsoever on a normal run. There's an always fun clicking button section with Circus Baby, a part where you follow Baby's movement instructions, and that's it. Putting this all into perspective, this game features a minigame where you do nothing but click on a metal slab, two minigames where you crawl through long hallways and wait a lot, a minigame that makes everyone who plays it want to tear their own teeth out, and trust me we will get to it shortly, one that has a surefire way to beat it every time and barely counts as an actual minigame, and one single minigame that I would consider very good. Do you see why I dislike this game? We are now about to cover night four of five, and there is only one actual minigame left. Night five has nothing on a normal playthrough that I would classify as an actual minigame or any kind of real gameplay, to be honest. It's pretty much just an extended ending cutscene. And no, I'm not forgetting Enter Night. We will be going over all that. But right now, I'm just trying to paint a picture of how little content Sister Location has on a normal playthrough that would actually qualify as a minigame or game of some kind. Here's another point. If each of these minigames was really good, I would absolutely have no issues here. It's not the amount of content that's the issue. It's what you're doing with said content that really matters. I have played tons of short games that were fun from start to finish, and I have high praise for. And if every single minigame in Sister Location was an absolute banger, I would be singing high praises right now. But the reality of the situation is, most of these minigames are either lacking in something or downright suck ass. What you're really left with here when you strip all the minigames away is an interactive visual novel, which is fine if you're into that, but personally, that's not why I play Five Nights at Freddy's games. And that's also not what I expect when I'm playing a Five Nights at Freddy's game. Love them or hate them, most of the original four games have extremely solid mechanics that can hook a player early and keep them going for all five nights. If I wasn't making a video on this game, I would have 100% dropped it at night four. Speaking of, video games need to have difficulty curves. I know, right? What a what a hot take. Ooh, really coming in there. Ooh. If a game is too easy the entire way through, a player might just get bored and stop playing at some point. If a game is too hard, 
a player might just give up straight away from the unfair challenge. You really need to find that sweet spot, whereas the player improves at the game, so will the game increase in difficulty. When it comes to the regular FNAF games, this is done fairly effortlessly. Every character has an AI level, and as you finish nights, those levels increase. On top of that, new threats are added to challenge the player on top of the existing knowledge they've gained from the previous nights. Sister Location, on the other hand, would be a very hard game to make a good difficulty curve for. Because each night is so different, the player isn't really learning anything from minigame to minigame that they could actually use going forward. The closest thing to that here would be the knowledge from Ballora Gallery kind of carrying over to Funtime Auditorium. So, I do indeed understand that making a super fair and balanced difficulty curve for a game like this would be a challenge. But oh my god, did Night 4 just drop the ball completely? The intention here was definitely to make this night tough as nails, but Jesus, nothing could have truly prepared the player for this. The night picks up right after the events of Night 3. Since Michael Lafton got jump scared by Funtime Foxy instead of properly finishing his shift, he finds himself trapped in a springlock suit in a dark room. Baby's dialogue kind of gets aggressive here, which is an odd tonal shift when you consider that only one night after this, Baby is once again playing nice and trying to help you. This being her mask off moment could have worked, but it really goes nowhere and feels out of place to happen here. Baby blabbers on a bit, Ballora fucking dies, and finally the night truly begins. Like I mentioned earlier, this night is literally just one minigame and nothing else. On each side of the springlock suit, you can see multiple different springlocks. These springlocks are constantly winding down, and you have to click your mouse over each of the springlocks to wind them back up. If a springlock fully winds down, it's game over, and you have to try again. However, on top of that, mini arenas will crawl up the side of the mask. If a mini arena fully climbs the mask, you get jump scared. The only way to stop them is to shake back and forth to make them fall off the mask. Here's the catch though. Every time you shake, the spring locks become more loose and wind down even further. So the goal here is to make sure you time your shakes at all the right moments to minimize the amount of shakes you have to do total during the entire minigame. This challenge lasts three full minutes and is a brutal difficulty spike in this game full of somewhat easy minigames and challenges up until this point. It really doesn't start off that bad. Winding down all the spring locks isn't much of an issue at the start, and you're able to manage everything fairly easily. However, around two minutes in, you'll find yourself struggling to keep the locks in check and panicking over making the smallest of mistakes. This makes it so the challenge never really gets that hard until it's around a minute away from being over. So doing multiple attempts over and over, knowing that you're so close every time, can be a little demotivating. Here's my thing with Night 4. If this minigame was fun, I would have no issues with it really. Sure, I'd still complain about the difficulty feeling out of place for this part of the game, but if it was fun, I would definitely be able to look past that. However, this minigame just isn't fun. It really just boils down to shaking when a mini arena is as high as it can get on the mask and praying to God you're able to keep the spring locks in check. It doesn't feel satisfying to replay over and over again, and it's a low point in the game even for people who like Sister Location as well. One of my biggest issues with this night is actually the lack of visual feedback given to the player. In this minigame, you have two distinct ways of losing. You can either let a mini arena fully crawl up the mask, or have a spring lock fully wind down. However, regardless of how you die, you still lose the same way every time. It doesn't matter which way you lose, you will always be jump scared by a mini arena. For a mini game that is this hard and even had to be patched to make it easier only days after launch, this is genuinely a huge oversight. It's important in a minigame like this to know 100% of the time how you lost. That way, you can use that information to properly try new strategies the next time you attempt it. Would it really have been that hard to have the spring lock mask close shut and a blood effect cover the screen if you die because of a spring lock? You can't even say this isn't a realistic expectation when both of these assets are already in the game. The spring lock mask opens before you play Night 4, so just reverse the damn thing, speed it up a bit, add a slight bump or shake effect for impact, and you have your closing animation. Even this blood splatter I speak of is literally in the game when you get scooped at the end of it. The assets were literally already there for this to work, but instead, we're left with looking at mini arenas for potentially hours of attempts depending on how much you struggle with this minigame. I was able to finish this minigame in about half an hour, but I was already getting bored of it by the 20 minute mark. The gameplay here is not engaging enough for me to actively want to deal with the bullshit for very long. Also, something I see almost nobody talk about is the swarm of mini arenas that crawl into the suits during this minigame. While it's a cool visual, it's an insanely poor idea to put something like this here. Someone going in blind 
will realistically think this is some kind of mechanic at first, and probably lose a few times trying to shake them away. Hey, maybe if this was linked to some kind of mechanic, and the whole thing was rebalanced a bit, it would be a lot more fun. Check the left, check the left. Top one, 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 and that's the entire night. I guess the implication here was that since this night is so hard, and the player will probably spend so long on it, that there was no need to add any extra content to it. Which I mean, fair I guess? But all it ends up doing is making this one of the weakest nights in the entire game. But now I ask you, what's worse? A night with one minigame that's insanely hard for some reason? or a night with pretty much zero content. One quick elevator ride and a haha <laughs> funny exotic butters joke later, and we finally made it to the last night of Sister Location. This night tasks you with going back through Funtime Auditorium to reach parts and service again. However, on your way through the auditorium, there's nothing that can actually jump scare you. That's right, here you're able to run through the room without actually doing a minigame. Here's my issue with that though. Yes, I understand why there's nothing here anymore from a story standpoint. All the animatronics are currently a pile of spaghetti holding a clown mask. But would this not have been the perfect moment in the game to finally reach back to some of those FNAF core gameplay roots? Here's what I mean. On night two, you go through Ballora Gallery. On night three, you have to go through Funtime Auditorium. Both of these sections involve crawling through a dark room and trying to reach the other side. So, wouldn't it have been really cool if now on night five, both of these mechanics were combined to serve as one final challenge that you would actually have practiced for already thanks to the previous crawling minigames. Just like in previous FNAF games, where each night things are added and difficulty is raised, this would serve as a perfect point in Sister Location to draw inspiration from those older titles to make an engaging and fun part of the game. It's literally the final night. Wouldn't a final, harder crawling challenge that tests your knowledge be literally perfect here? But no, because of this game's absurd checkpoint system, Scott decided to make this area empty because if you die at any point during night 5, you have to go all the way back here and crawl through Funtime Auditorium again. Anyway, when you make it to parts and service, Baby makes you do a couple things similar to the Funtime Freddy parts and service section. Clicking on a few buttons, inputting a code, and sending her away on a conveyor belt. That's all I'll say about this section... for now. But we'll come back to it a bit later. Once Baby is successfully moved on the conveyor belt, she instructs you to go back into the auditorium and follow some movement instructions. If you mess up any of the movement instructions, Maskless Ennard will jump scare you. Successfully follow Baby's instructions, and you're greeted with the scooping room. You then proceed to get scooped of all your insides and worn like a skin suit by Ennard. The end. While this ending cutscene is very cool, the buildup of Night 5 is so non-existent that it leaves me with a feeling of, that's it? No big final minigame or anything at all, really? Just a bit of button clicking and crawling in the dark? However, I know you're just all on the edge of your seats right now wondering, what about Ennard Knight? Alright, so here's the deal, okay? Night 5 not having any actual minigame is kind of a lie. On a normal playthrough, there isn't anything. However, if you're able to unlock the secret ending, there is a full classic FNAF style minigame waiting for you to beat. Which is insanely cool as a concept. Sure, it would have hit harder if the rest of the game was good, but just the fact it's there is at least something to look forward to. So, you're probably wondering, how do you unlock this secret ending? Okay, so occasionally when you game over in Sister Location, instead of the normal game over screen, you're met with a pixelated minigame, where you play a circus baby and give cupcakes to children. You're given a pretty strict time limit here, and have to feed the kids the cupcakes in a certain order to feed them all. Once every kid is fed, an ice cream cone will be waiting at the end of the map. You have to take this ice cream cone all the way back to the start of the map to truly beat the minigame. On paper, the idea is okay, in execution, this sucks. This I, this sucks so bad. It's let me, okay. Let me explain. This mini game is hard as hell to master if you're going into the game blind. You need to do a lot of specific things to complete it, and the only real hint you have is that extra bit of baby dialogue from earlier in the game. Once you figure out how to do it all, it becomes second nature. But learning how to do this whole thing perfectly can take a while. Clearly, Scott understood this. 
Having the player need a random chance game over minigame for an opportunity to try and beat the minigame is kind of an insane task. His solution to this? Have a secret 8-bit baby hidden away on the extras menu that lets you play the minigame as many times as you want. This then brings up the question, what in the world was the point of this being a death minigame at all? Any sane person would never do this during the main story playing for the first time. So it really just boils down to, hey, do you want the secret ending? Play this minigame on the extras menu until you beat it. This makes it feel so disconnected from the rest of the game in a really weird way, when there were clearly better ways to unlock a secret ending just sitting all over the rooms in Sister Location. A lot of the rooms have button and number pads that you can even interact with. So why isn't the secret ending this crazy puzzle, where on night 5, you need to explore the whole location for clues and pieces of the puzzle so you can input some special code that then unlocks the baby minigame for you to play? That way, not only would the environments actually be put to good use, but the 8-bit minigame would feel way less disconnected from the rest of the game than it currently does. FNAF 3 has this insanely cool secret ending that requires you to punch numbers into the wall tiles, explore the cameras, and glitch in and out of minigames. Scott has done similar stuff to what I'm asking for right now. It just feels like such a waste to have this ending essentially locked behind an extras menu game. I am a master at this minigame now, though. I mean, just watch this. All right, let's get this shit over with. Oh my god. Lamest way to unlock a secret ending in the series thus far aside, what about the actual meat and potatoes here? What about Ennard Knight? Once you've successfully given the ice cream to Elizabeth Afton, you're able to go back into Night 5 and reach the secret ending. To do that, you have to play the game normally until you reach the part where Baby instructs you with directions in the dark. Instead of listening to her, immediately go up and right to reach the private room. The private room is set up like a classic FNAF game, with a couple twists. You have the standard doors on each side of the room and a camera to check the location, but now there's a top vent as well that you can close. This night features Ennard trying to get into the room by using any of the three entrances. It's your your job to track them on the camera and block the correct doors when the time is right. However, there's a catch. The power in this is brutal. If you lose too much power at any point during the night, it's probably game over. The actual goal here is to not use your cameras as much as possible to save power and instead listen to Ennard's audio cues to time your movements. Every time Ennard moves, a sound can be heard. You can use these sounds to track them throughout the location without even checking the cameras. Essentially what this boils down to is checking the three cameras that are closest to the three different room entrances and using his positions on the cameras mixed with his sound cues to know when to shut the doors. The night itself is actually not that hard. It's pretty simple to track Ennard and it only really gets super crazy near the end. The real challenge here comes with how much power you have. It almost feels unfair at times how strict this is. If Ennard decides to be a dick and chills at the door for too long, it's hard to make a comeback after that. During the multiple hours I attempted Ennard Knight, almost every single death I had was linked to running out of power and not my own abilities to block Ennard out of the room. But wait, if this knight is so simple minus the power being a bitch, why did this take me so long? Well friends, it's time to introduce you to the absolute worst of Sister Location's checkpoint system. I'm just gonna be straight up here, if I wasn't making a video on this game, there is no way in hell I would have actually gone through with beating this. But I did, <laughs> oh I did, and now I'm here to tell the tale. Okay, so as we've already established, Ender Knight has an extremely strict power limit that makes it a pretty tough challenge that will realistically take an average player quite a while to overcome. Most tough FNAF challenges are like this, so that's not that big of a surprise. It's never an issue though, because if you die, you can always just restart from the beginning right away and give it another shot. But how silly of me. I forgot, this isn't just most FNAF games. This is Sister Location. <laughs> so what was messed up this time? What do you think the punishment is for losing Ennard Knight? You're sent all the way back to the very start of the night. Not the start of Ennard Knight, the start of Sister Location Night 5. Yes, every single time you lose in this hard challenge, you have to crawl through the auditorium again, do baby's keypad again, click all the buttons again, watch her slowly move on the conveyor belt again, disobey her orders again, and crawl to the safe room again. Every. Single. Time. Somehow, this isn't the worst part. In this game, full of scripted elements that never change, 
one of the few things that is actually randomized is the numbers you have to input on baby's tiny ass keypad. So every single time you lose, you have to wait for baby to slowly tell you all the numbers as your hand is shaking because one small slip up on the keypad means a game over and a one-way ticket back to the start of the night. This is, this is insane. This turns Enter Night into an absolute slog to actually beat and increases the runtime of the game for literally no reason. I think now would be the best time to finally talk about the awful cursor Sister Location has. For some reason, instead of just using your computer's normal mouse, the game replaces it with a terrible custom cursor that is comically large. It makes looking around any room feel weird. For some reason, the mouse bends and curves with the cylinder effect, which looks super bad, and it makes sections like the keypad one an absolute pain because of how large and finicky the cursor is. Because of this fake cursor, Sister Location is one of those evil games that traps your regular mouse in place and makes it unusable in any section where the fake cursor is in use. So if you need to tab out for a second, too bad. Either close the entire game, force the fucking task manager open to free yourself, or exit to the title screen to get the normal mouse back. Absolutely terrible. But hey, uh, at least the music track here is pretty goddamn good. Leon Riskin did an incredible job with Sister Location's OST. In fact, I've played a lot of the tracks from it during this video. The obvious standouts here are Venta Black and Watch Your Six, but there's a lot of great ambient tracks here. Anyway, once Enter Night is finally completed, Michael Afton goes home, finishes his TV show finally, and lives happily ever after with Ennard. The end. Again. And that was Five Nights at Freddy's Sister Location. A game with a lot of good ideas that is sadly bogged down with its lackluster gameplay, insane game design choices, and near complete lack of replayability. As much as I do not like this game, I still care about it and wish it was better because there's so much cool stuff here. I wouldn't have made this massive video if I wasn't passionate about all this. Trust me. Anyway, if you like or even love Sister Location, that's a-okay. I'm just grateful you even gave this video the time of day and heard me out. If you have any strong opinions about the game, please leave them in the comments. I would love to read some hot takes regardless if they are positive or negative. But I'm forgetting something, aren't I? Right. Custom Night. A few months after Sister Location came out, Scott put out a Custom Night update that builds upon the base work laid out by Ennard Knight. What are my thoughts on it? Mostly positive, actually. In fact, I really, really enjoyed playing it. So much that I think it would be weird to tack on this really positive section at the end of a mostly negative, comprehensive breakdown video. So, tune in eventually. I don't know 100% when, but eventually for a follow-up to this video where I go over everything about Custom Night. I want to thank you all for watching this entire video, Acid for making the hilarious thumbnail, and Pastor for doing a segment earlier on. I don't see myself making another video this long for a while, so I hope you enjoyed it. As always, I've been a yeah, and have a good one everybody.